Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Could I just ask now we all take our seats? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're away. So welcome to the Exist quarterly event, first of this year. My name's Carl Friedrich. I'm a partner with Hawley. We're consulting engineers, and I've been interim chair for the last few months. This is my last uh, stint because I'll be handing over to Cloda. Uh, Murphy will be taking over from tomorrow. So uh, as I said, this is a live streaming event. Uh, we have we had three speakers. We now have two speakers. One's had to pull out at short notice, which so we're going to extend the, the, the initial two. Um, question and answers are at the end of each speaker, and what we'll do, we have a roving microphone, so I'll just ask you to wait for the microphone to arrive before you ask your questions. Thank you very much. So first on, we have Dr. Lisa Price from the University of Exeter, and Lisa and her team's work involves measuring and monitoring physical activity using wearable devices. Alongside this, they also involve a large number of large-scale trials to increase physical activity to improve both physical and mental health. Um, and as a group, they work with a range of populations, ranging from paediatrics to older adults and a variety, variety of health outcomes. So, Lisa, over to you. It's live. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for that introduction. So, my name's Lisa Price. I'm going to talk to you today about how we use technology to assess and quantify physical activity and how we relate that to health outcomes and well-being outcomes. So I'm part of a wider research team which looks at physical activity and health across a lifespan. So as was said in the introduction, we range from paediatric populations all the way up to older adults. And as a research group, we're interested in many different health outcomes. So we work with people with heart failure, with diabetes, obesity, bone health, cancer and mental health. So we've got quite a wide variety of populations that we're interested in. 
we also work quite a lot with what we would call a normal healthy population. Now, before I go on to talk specifically about how we use technology within this research, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a background about why physical activity is important and why our research is important. So, very brief history lesson. Physical activity research basically started in the 1950s. So the catalyst for physical activity and health was the London bus study, which was undertaken by Professor Jerry Morris. And this is basically a comparison of bus drivers and bus conductors and their cardiovascular risk. So here we have two groups of men that had the same occupational conditions, they had the same social backgrounds that we think might influence health. So all these aspects were the same across these two groups. But what was found in the study is that bus drivers had a 50% higher incidence rate of cardiovascular disease and a 50% higher increased risk of cardiovascular disease in the future. Now, the only difference between these two groups was the amount of activity that was achieved during their occupational time. So we know that bus drivers tend to sit down for around six days a week, they were sat down, while the bus conductors were up and down the buses, on and off, up and down the stairs collecting tickets. So this was the catalyst for why physical activity became an important measure for health research. If we look to more recent research, we know that physical activity and increasing your activity reduces your mortality risk compared to no activity. This is even when we account for other aspects that can influence our health, such as smoking status, alcohol consumption, BMI, and other diseases. We see the same kind of results when we look at specific sports. So we know that those that play specific sports have a much lower mortality risk than those that don't. Really importantly, we know that if we remove physical inactivity as a risk factor, then we can prevent a lot of new cases of different diseases. So we can prevent around 20% of new cancers just by removing inactivity. And again, this is while we're controlling for other aspects that can influence health. So age, gender, psychological well-being, uh, smoking and alcohol consumption. Importantly as well, if we remove physical activity, we can actually add around one year onto everybody's life. Now that doesn't sound very much. You might think one year to do some activity. But if we look at that in a population level, we add around 70 million life years to the UK population. So it's a really important aspect for us to look at in terms of research and health. Now you might be thinking, if we know all this, what's the problem? Well, we know that people don't achieve the amount of physical activity that we'd like them to. So this data is taken from the Health Survey for England, which basically asks people to report whether they meet the government recommendations for physical activity for both aerobic and muscular strengthening exercise. And you can see we have sort of a linear decline with age, which is kind of what we'd expect. But even with the highest prevalence, we're still only meeting around 50%. So that means 50% of our youngest population, excluding children, are meeting the government guidelines. And males consistently do more than females. This is a trend that we see in children as well. Now, importantly, this is based on what people tell us that they do. Okay, so we know that people aren't always truthful. And if I asked you how much physical activity you did yesterday, you might be more inclined to exaggerate the truth. So when we use an objective measure, and specifically we like to use accelerometers, which are movement sensors, the prevalence of people achieving the government guidelines actually drops quite substantially. So we go from around 40% in men to around 6%, and 30% in women down to around 4%. So this is, a real, sorry, this is a real problem for us in terms of how much resource we put in to these physical activity interventions. If we're not grasping the scale of the issue due to self-report techniques, then we're likely not to invest as much money in trying to overcome these problems. So this is where we come in. We use objective measures, namely accelerometers, which are these devices in the centre. And we use these to assess physical activity and try and quantify everyday events. So if we think of somebody's life as a series of continuous events, there's no gaps in between, and there are different behavioural events that occur across the day. We can ask people to wear these monitors 
for a period of seven days or longer, and we can try and quantify each of those individual events. In order to make some form of meaning from this data, so an accelerometer is basically a proxy measure of movement. So it assesses how fast somebody's moving in relation to distance, sorry, in relation to time. So we have to try and create physical activity metrics that allow us to quantify what people are doing. And we do that by relating it to some biological, physiological, or behavioral meaning. So from that, we can get an idea of how intense somebody's working, so how hard they're, physical, uh, they're physically working, what physical capacity they're using. We can have an idea of how long they're working for at that intensity and how frequently those events occur. We can also get an idea of the total volume of activity. Now, volume activity is really important, but we also need to look at the specific pattern in which that volume occurs. So, for example, I could do the same amount of volume as one of you sat down, but I might accumulate my physical activity in a completely different manner than you do. So I might get up and go for a run in the morning, and that's my physical activity achieved for the day. That's my 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Whereas one of you might accumulate it in 10 or 5 minute bouts across the day. So we're really, interesting, uh, we're really interested in establishing what pattern of behaviour is most beneficial for different health outcomes. And as a research group, we're also interested in identifying specific behaviours using the accelerometer trace that we get. So we're able to measure movement on three different planes, or three axes, and we can start to look at how that movement pattern is occurring, so we can say what specific behaviours people are doing, whether they're walking, running, sitting, standing, and so on. So I'd just like to show you this is an accelerometer trace. This is somebody's average daily activity. So we can see we have peaks and troughs in the data. The higher the peak, the higher the intensity that they're working at. And we can see those peaks and troughs vary in terms of length. So we've got quite a prolonged period of sitting down or inactivity here and again down here. And the higher spikes tend to not happen for very long. So we can look at this pattern of behaviour and we can see how this relates to specific disease outcomes. So for example, this might be a normal healthy person. If we looked at somebody with heart failure, we would see a very different pattern of behaviour. So what happens in heart failure is they tend to get up in the morning, we'd have some slightly lower peaks than we've got here, but we'd have our peaks all occurring sort of in the morning time and then we'd have a very low level of activity with maybe a, an occasional peak throughout the rest of the day. So we can relate that pattern of behaviour to a specific disease outcome. We can also then use that to inform us of how we might want to change the pattern of behaviour in order to benefit a certain disease outcome. So if we stay with heart failure, can we change somebody's pattern of behaviour later in the day so that they're getting up and doing more physical activity, uh, which will help change their disease outcome? So just to show you this in a slightly different manner, a different schematic. So here we can see particular life events. So on this side of the screen, we've got the sequence of physical activity events by days of the week. And in orange, we have sleep time. In the beige color, we have inactivity or very low activity levels. And then in the blue, we have different intensities. And the darker the color, the higher the intensity. So we can start to categorize each different event that occurs. If there's a longer bandwidth, obviously we're doing that for a longer amount of time. So we get a really good idea of the pattern of activity that we can create. And this is just the same but broken down uh, for one day, hour by hour. So we can see ex the exact pattern that people are creating. Now this is really important for us in terms of establishing links with health outcomes. If we can establish this pattern of behaviour in a large-scale population, then we're more, um, we're more likely to understand what that physical activity um, relationship is with, the di with different health outcomes. So, for example, the UK Biobank has around 100,000 records of accelerometry data for seven days a week. So we can pattern people's days for 100,000 people and link that with multiple different health measures that they've collected. 
So why is it really important for us to do this? Well, as I've just said, we can understand the, uh, the physical activity exposure and specific health outcomes. So we can understand what physical activity is required um, to have certain specific relationships with health. And those exposures might differ depending on what the health outcome is. If we're looking to influence somebody's health, we know the exact dose that we have to, uh, not the exact dose that we have to give them, but that we can recommend that they do in order to achieve a health benefit. We're able to detect temporal trends. So this is in population data. Now we can use technology um, to assess wide varieties of populations. We can look at whether different populations differ in their activity over a longitudinal period. And we can also assess very minute changes that might occur as a result of an intervention. So we know that some physical activity interventions or some health interventions don't detect any changes when they use um, self-report measures. But we can detect tiny minute changes that might occur with the physical activity data by using this technology. So these are the sum of the companies that we work with. So they range from um, charities to research councils. Uh, we've got Devon and Cornwall Police in here that we've done a bit of work with. And Active Insights is one of our main partners. So Active Insights create one of the accelerometers that we use, the Gene Active device. And our research group together with Gene Active offer a service of activity informatics. So we work really closely with Active Insights to um, accommodate the needs of different researchers and different companies that might want to do an activity intervention. So we work with those researchers from the very uh, outset of their research question. So they might come to us with a, a problem or research question that they want answering. We help them with the design of the study so that they can get the most appropriate metrics of physical activity that are related, uh, relatable to their specific physical activity and health outcome. We also then work with them in terms of collecting the data and managing that data. And we then provide a summary and a translation for them so they understand what that data is showing them. This is a relatively new partnership that's been set up through the university. Uh, so it's still in the early stages, but it's going quite well at the moment. So I'd like to give you a few examples of where we've used different technologies uh, within our research. So the first of which uh, I'd like to bring you to is, was done by a colleague of mine, Richard Pulsford. And here Richard was looking at whether the pattern of a sitting day or a normal working day could be broken up to um, improve glucose and insulin levels in the blood. So this is really important if we think about pre-diabetics or people predisposed to getting diabetes. So a normal working day, for me anyway, is I go and sit in my office and I might get up to make a cup of tea or use the facilities, and then I sit back down again. But I don't really move that much. So we know that sitting is bad in terms of uh, glucose levels and insulin. So Rich got people to come into the lab and basically recreated a sitting day, what you would normally do in your office. So they came in at around just before nine, and they sat down until around five-ish. During that time, they were given an oral glucose tolerance test, which if you've ever had one, is absolutely disgusting. It's a really sugary drink. Uh, and then they were given a very controlled meal. Throughout that day, they had lots of blood samples taken uh, to, lev uh, to measure the levels of glucose and insulin in their blood. This was then repeated, but with either standing breaks or walking breaks. So at any point that these arrows touched this line, they were... Uh, either instructed to stand for a couple of minutes, so that was one day, and the blood samples were collected again, and then the subsequent day they were asked to walk at these intervals instead of standing. And what they found was that actually the standing um, condition didn't make any difference. So there was no difference between standing up at your desk and sitting down at your desk. Now, this might be uh, news to some people, so we know that standing desks are quite prevalent and we have a lot of them within the university, but standing isn't enough to give you the health benefits that you need in order to reduce your glucose and your insulin levels. Okay, what they did find though was a significant difference 
when they were asked to walk. So that if we want to impact on our glucose levels or our insulin levels after a certain meal, and then we know that we need to do that by doing physical activity rather than just standing up. Now this is really important because this now allows us to think about where we place our breaks around meal times. So do we need to do a walk straight after a meal or before a meal? And we think about that in terms of the next stage of the research. So we start to look at the patterning of when you place your physical activity throughout the day. So another example of where we've used specific technology um, within physical activity research. This is a piece of work we did for a, a charity called Living Streets. They're a charity that are interested in getting people out walking rather than using transport. So they run a year-round walk to school programme. And children are asked to record when, how they get to school using any of these modes. Uh, and if they record an active way, then they're able to get a badge for their class. And the more badges you get, the more points your class has. So it's a bit like a competition. They wanted to know if this was a valid measure for assessing the way that children get to school. So to do that, we asked the children to wear a gene active accelerometer for seven days, which they're quite happy to do. It's quite a comfortable monitor to wear. And during that time, they were also asked to fill in the travel tracker. Now, with information from the school and from the parents, we were able to isolate the travel to school period. And using a certain number of uh, different criteria, we could say whether that travel to school period was active or not. So we could look at whether there was agreement between what children say they were doing and what the monitor um, told us they were actually doing. And we found that they agreed on around, well, just over 50% of journeys. But the, the travel tracker was more accurate when children were recording active travel than they were than when they were recording non-active travel. So if they travelled to school actively, they were more likely to say they were, and we could pick that up on the monitor. If they didn't record, and if they were actually got to school by non-active transport, they weren't necessarily reporting that. So this was a really good piece of work um, that I I'm not sure Living Streets were entirely happy with the outcome. Um, obviously, this is a whole part of their intervention, but it's just one way in which we use uh, the technology to try and validate and work with different companies. So I'm just going to go into these um, really briefly, the next two. So we've done quite a lot of work with Devon and Cornwall Police. The first one is not really technology based, um, but they asked us to assess whether their current fitness standards were appropriate for police officers uh, when they're out on the beat. So this is a really interesting study. We did a lot of focus groups with police officers to ask them what their key tasks were. We then measured the oxygen consumption and the energy expenditure required to do that work. Um, and then we looked at what the current fitness standards were. Can't tell you the results of that yet. So there's still, um, we need uh, permission from the police force to repeat any of those. Um, but it was shocking, I'll just say it was shocking. <laughs> And then the next trial that we've done with them is they really wanted to improve the fitness, uh, sorry, the health of their workforce. So this is both officers and staff. So they asked us to get involved with an exploratory trial using wearable technology. So we gave the officers a Fitbit and we linked that to a smartphone app. And the app was um, all about behavior change techniques and working with other people to try and alter the amount of physical activity that they did. The Fitbit was basically there to monitor their steps. With the idea being that they would then increase the physical activity of their workforce, and which might be a surprise. You might think of uh, police officers as being quite physically active, but it's becoming an increasingly sedentary role. Along with increasing physical activity levels, they wanted to improve the overall psychological well-being of their staff, reduce the stress that the staff felt, and increase their productivity. And this is a trial that has just finished, so we're analysing the results, and again, we'd have to get permission before we share those, but as it happens, we're not in a position to share the results at the moment anyway. But this is a really successful trial in terms of people uptaking the trial. They were quite interested, they really wanted to get involved, possibly because they got a free Fitbit and then they got to keep the Fitbit afterwards, um, but it was a really well-received trial throughout the whole of the police force. 
And then finally, I just want to think about how we use technology to detect temporal trends in physical activity and health, and how this um, is important for sort of patterning behaviour. So if we think about the temporality of our days, so I might do one particular event, and that might impact on the event that we do later on in the day. What we wanted to know was whether doing a physical activity event would impact on somebody's mood later on in that day. And if that was the case, how long did that bout have to be? And how intense did we have to work? And how proximal to our mood, uh, or how proximal to our mood measurement did that event have to be in order to have a specific impact? So in order to do that, we combined accelerometry with something called ecological momentary assessment. So this is in the moment assessment of different aspects. And here it was specifically mood. So this was taken in a community dwelling sample of depressed adults. So they self-referred to our trial. And we asked them to wear an accelerometer for seven days. And during that seven days, they were also asked to respond to two text messages a day, rating their mood on a scale of one to 10. From that data, we're able to locate where the mood score is and work backwards in the data to say what was the last bout of activity that people did. How intense was that activity and how long did it last? We can also work forwards from the mood score to say after the mood score, what was the next bout of activity that they did? And we can look at whether the previous activity impacts on mood and then whether mood impacts on subsequent activity. Now this is going to be really beneficial for us if we're looking to try and improve mood in depressed patients. So we could potentially say that somebody has to do just a five minute bout of activity in order to increase their mood. Now what we don't know is how long that impact will last. Okay, And obviously somebody's previous mood score will impact on their mood later. So there's quite a lot of variables that we need to take account for when we're thinking about this kind of research. We've just finished collecting this data, so it's ready to be analysed. I'm sure you can imagine it's quite a complex analysis uh, that we're currently going through. So there are just some ideas of how we use um, technology within our physical activity research, and I'm happy to take any questions. Lisa, Lisa, thank you. Robert Castro from the Impact Lab up at the Science Park. So really interesting piece of research, thank you. Uh, I'm always interested in how these uh, applied research projects are rolled out to get scale. H has any work been done on that? Um, for the particular, the one that we've just talked about? Yes. Yes. No, so no work's been done in that yet. So this was a really um, sort of pilot study. It was actually part of a larger scale trial that we were running. Um, and it was a, almost a last minute idea that we'll, we'll throw this in at the beginning. So this was only on a sample of around 42 participants. So in terms of rolling it out to get in larger participants, that will definitely be an issue when we try and do it. <laughs> Great, well I'd look forward to uh, following up with you on that. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Lisa. Really interesting talk. Paul Shepard from Exist. One of your earlier slides uh, showed the relation between inactivity and certain uh, disease states. Yes. Cardiovascular, I can understand. Diabetes, I can understand. Colorectal mm -hmm. cancer, which was one of the highest prevalence um, uh, diseases identified, I have problems trying to understand uh, the direct correlation mm -hmm. between exercise and the development of colorectal cancer. Is this actually, this data, actually telling us something about the nature of the disease, possibly? Or what are your thoughts about that? It's not telling us anything about the mechanisms of how, no, no, the no. Of how that would work. Um, so the I put the reference online. I can send you the paper if you're interested. But um, no, we're not sure about the mechanisms of how that would work. Um, so mm. my area isn't cancer in particular. No, no, um, no, no. But obviously it accounts for all other aspects that could influence um, 
and the development of cancer. So there is something unique about inactivity that is adding to that yeah. disease burden. Um, Perhaps if you're active, you're eating more healthily. And Possibly. Which has a, well, I don't know. Yeah, we know that no obesity is, is a risk factor for cancer as well, sure. but that was accounted for, right? BMI yeah. was accounted for. Whether they accounted for body fat percentage, um, I don't know. So we know that BMI mm. is not necessarily a good indicator. No, no, it doesn't take well account of muscle well mass or fat mass. Yeah. So whether that was that might be a mechanism mm. um, is one thing. I don't uh, know. Just very interesting result. Thank you very much. Hi, Lisa. Uh, really interested in that. Um, I, I come from a background where fit in mind, fit in body. And, and there's a health focus here in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, living healthier. Yeah. Uh, have you done any work which links the activity to cognitive ability and increased performance in that respect? Um, there is work that looks at cognitive ability. So there's quite a big um, group within the university that looks at dementia research. And we know that physical activity th can improve cognitive ability. I haven't done any specific work with that. My background is more paediatric, but mental health as well. Um, so we know that physical activity can increase ad, um, academic attainment and concentration in class, things like that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, hello, thank you, Lisa. That's re really interesting. Um, as a nutritionist, um, I help my clients with the whole range of exercise mm -hmm. activity, nutrition, obviously. Um, you mentioned in one of your earlier slides that you will be able to find out at what at which point of the day it would be more beneficial to be active. So yes. would that be before a lunch or before a meal or after mm -hmm. a meal? Uh, that would be really interesting for me to know because I w that would be something my clients would certainly be interested in. And do you have any more findings about that yet? Um, not yet, no. So as I said, that was Richard's research and he's very interested in um, diabetes and planning physical activity around meal times to prevent okay. that kind of thing. Um, please feel free to get in touch with Rich. He's more than welcome to, he was more than happy to take questions about Lovely. that. About Thank search. you very much. <laughs> oh, Lisa, I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, David Greensmith from uh, Glen King PR. Mine's a, a fairly simple question. There's lots of us that have, um, you know, mobile phones and apps, and we check all that data mm -hmm. to make sure we're doing enough, you know, exercise and eating the right things. Have you done any comparisons with the detail that you're doing against the millions of people that use this every day? So there's a lot of work that sort of tries to validate Fitbits and look at whether they're um, valid or not. What we tend to find is with smartphone apps and other wearable tech that are commercially available, the step counter tends to be the most accurate. So that's the easiest thing for um, them to get right, basically. Now, there's no difference between the accelerometer in your phone and the accelerometer that we use. So the actual inner workings, um, the accelerometer section, should be absolutely the same across all devices. The only difference is is the algorithm that they use to say whether you're in different activity intensities or not. So we calibrate ours gase, uh, based on gas analysis. So that's the only way that we can know how much energy people are expending and in terms what intensity they're working at. Now we know that smartphone apps and Fitbits either haven't done that work or they haven't released their algorithms for us to know uh, whether they're accurate or not. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you very much. A uh, question for me. How bad were the police? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't <dare> say. <laughs> it's live. <laughs> great. Thanks, Lisa. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> but before we go on to James, can I just ask, you've all got a, a slip of paper on your on your seats, could I could I ask really uh, not during James's talk, obviously, but try and think. Uh, we'd be interested to know what you might like to see as a part of a, another future quarterly event. Actually, right then, James Bogue, Boig, sorry, James Bogue, sorry, James, um, on the healthy pro uh, healthy people program lead. Right, so Greater Exeter is one of twelve successful local delivery pilots across the country, working with Sport England to identify new approaches to tackling inactivity 
and developing happier, healthier communities. Um, the overall ambition is to make Exeter the most active city in England, and Cranbrook is a pioneering place for families to be active together. So, James, over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here today and see some familiar faces in the room and also um, pleased to, to meet you all and looking forward to catching up with you uh, after the event. Hopefully, this talk will actually really develop and move on from uh, Lisa's talk, actually, around the, the kind of research and the health benefits. And um, I'm here today to talk to you about a practical opportunity, a really exciting program that we're, uh, we're bringing to Exeter and Cranbrook, um, funded nationally by Sport England. Um, I'm recently in post at Exeter City Council as our Active and Healthy People lead, uh, actually more focused at um, working with inactive and unhealthy people. So I'm not sure my uh, title is, is, is quite right. Um, this is a really interesting slide because hopefully it demonstrates all of the wonderful opportunities that are already happening in our city and in Cranbrook. And I know that there are some partners in the room and it's great to see Julian uh, and Stacey from the City Community Trust here, all delivering a fantastic range of different programs, initiatives and projects across the, across the city in Cranbrook. And I think we're really lucky um, in Exeter and Cranbrook to be living in such a beautiful part of the world with so many great opportunities to be out and about and be active. Um, you can see there the key, uh, the football club, the rugby club. Um, there's a photo just near the top left-hand corner where we were really, really fortunate to have the um, Tour of Britain in Cranbrook um, launched there last September, and it brought out thousands and thousands of people into our newest communities just up, up the road. So the purpose of this program, and I'll talk through the, the detail behind it, is to actually really help um, those individuals across our communities who maybe don't have access to physical activity and sport and there are a whole heap of reasons uh, and barriers to why somebody might not be active on a, on a regular basis. Um, I don't want to even try and compete with the intelligence of a, of a doctor from the university. Um, my, my, I'm, I don't come from an academic or a research background. Uh, actually, I come from a, a world of walk, uh, a world of working on lots of different delivery programs and campaigns within sport and physical activity development over the last 15 years. And our bible is the National Active Lives Survey, which is the self-reported survey. Um, there might be some people uh, in the room that have taken part in that survey over recent years. Um, Anybody put a hand up if they've um, been contacted by Ipsos Mori or Sport England to ask them about how active they are? In interesting. Um, so I'll ask you to, uh, questions around how, how active are you, how often, what sports you take part in, whether you're part of a local club, your attitudes, motivations and behaviours. But as Lisa said, we absolutely know that um, uh, those questionnaires, those surveys are quite um, highly um, over-reported, even up to sort of 400% in terms of what actually goes on. But nevertheless, the Active Live Survey is the largest global survey reporting on um, people's physical activity behaviour. And just some of the details and the stats show you there, nationally, around one in four people are doing less than 30 minutes a week of physical activity to realise the health, social and broader benefits, um, which is a, a, a stark issue. Um, and in, in Exeter and Cranbrook, that represents around uh, 25 to 30,000 people who are, who, are who are only doing naught to 30 minutes a week. So they're very much our focus for this particular programme. Just a quick bit of background about Sport England. They're the national lottery distributor on behalf of government and, of, and invest a billion pounds into community sport and physical activity year on year. It's fair to say over the last 20 years, the lion's share of that investment has gone into more formal, more traditional sport, and has helped already fairly sporty people be more active um, and take part more in their local sports clubs, gyms, leisure centres, and more traditional settings. Most recently, following on from government strategy, Physical activity and sport investment and strategy through Sport England is now much more focused at inactive people. So how we can help people who don't have those opportunities on a regular basis to become more active. That's really, really important and is one reason why Sport England have invested into Exeter and Cranbrook to help people in our city uh, and in, on, around the outskirts uh, of Exeter to be more active. Um, I, I think your questions will be, okay, so that's the national average, one in four people doing less than 30 minutes a week. What about Exeter? Well, actually, we can tell a pretty good story here. Um, we are the most active local authority in the whole of the country and have been for the last three years, which is really, really interesting. Um, and the reasons behind that are probably to do with the demographics of the area. Actually, we have quite a young population through the university and the colleges. And for those reasons around, we have a, 
fantastic environment to be active. It's quite an affluent place, and actually the types of populations that we have down here tend to be more active. Um, we know that the city has grown in terms of population and economic growth over the last 10 to 20 years, but actually that has been at a price, and we still see around 20% of the population that are inactive and experiencing those really uh, poor health outcomes and poor social outcomes that, that Lisa talked about. The spread across the populations is really interesting. Um, the, the data nationally tells us that um, those people from more affluent backgrounds and on higher incomes, higher salaries, tend to be two to three more times more active than people on lower incomes or out of work. And all that evidence, supporting the national strategy, takes us towards what um, the programme I'm going to talk to you about today, which is the local delivery pilot. Um, so recently, Sport England new strategy in May 2017, much more focused in activity, and the flagship investment programme for Sport England is the local delivery pilot, which is taking a new approach, rather than investing in national governing bodies, in particular sports, looking at local places to invest. And in fact, Julian was in the room back in uh, February 2017 where we went to a national workshop with Sport England and they launched the local delivery pilot program. And at the time, they were seeking to invest in 10 to 12 areas across the country to test out new ways to get people active. And at that point, we were working with a broad range of local partners in Exeter and Cranbrook, including the football club, the rugby club, Active Devon, the local leisure provider, uh, Devon County Council, East Devon Council, Exeter City Council, on a broad range of initiatives. And we thought that this opportunity was great for Exeter and Cranbrook for us to pitch nationally to Sport England that we would be a great place for, for them to test and for them to invest in. And this is the outcome of that assessment program. So last year, um, we spent nine months pulling together a bid with over 40 organisations across Exeter and Cranbrook, articulating what the challenges were down here for people to be active and how, with that investment from Sport England, we could grow the amount of people taking part in sport on a regular, daily and weekly basis. You'll see from the map, um, really competitive, and out of 113 national applications, Exeter and Cranbrook last December were selected as one of 12 across the country to receive a share of £100 million to help more people be active on a regular basis. A couple of strategic things around the red dots. Um, you'll see that we are pretty much the only place in the southwest or the south. You have to go quite a number of miles up to Birmingham or into London for the nearest place. So strategically, the southwest will be looking at Exeter and Cranbrook to help tell them some of those answers about how we get inactive people active. And also, Cranbrook is the only healthy new town across the country that Sport England are investing in. So as a new community, uh, for those of you that live there, you'll know that back in sort of 2009, 2010, Green Devon Fields, that's now growing on a really rapid basis of around five to 600 homes year on year, and I think up to a population of around 25,000 uh, by 2030. Um, so um, completely different context in which to be active. There isn't currently a leisure centre in Cranbrook. There isn't the normal sport and physical activity infrastructure that you'd see normally through community clubs, volunteers, a really high proportion of families. Um, there's, I think there's four times the number of naught to four-year-olds in Cranbrook compared to the national average. So when you balance that against the broader population of East Devon, it's a really different community and there's going to be the need to do different things with that community to help those families be active. These are the national outcomes that Sport England are seeking to achieve through the local delivery pilot. More people leaving, le leading active lives on a regular basis. Improved inclusivity. Uh, we know that people from underrepresented groups, disabled people, uh, older people, tend to be less active than the mainstream population. Improving those wider outcomes. Traditionally, we've all thought, yeah, sport's great. I want to participate in sport. Um, and actually, participation for partic participation's sake. But we now know that physical activity plays a really broad role to those wider national outcomes that the government are seeking to achieve. Health outcomes, social outcomes, the role that physical activity and sport plays in economic growth, how it helps individuals in terms of their confidence, their se self-esteem, their resilience. And finally, Sport England, through this programme, and working with Exeter and Cranbrook and those other 11 places, um, want to see transformational change and how you rep replicate that across the country. So the things that we test and learn here over the next four years um, on the ground, how can we demonstrate that that can be replicated in other places across the country? Why Exeter and Cranbrook? 
The feedback that we received from Sport England was that it's a perfect uh, sized place to test and learn things. Uh, it's a city that you can put your arms around, both in terms of geography and stakeholders. There's a real track record of stakeholders and partners working together to achieve things. Um, we've got some really great examples. Currently, we're delivering a program called Get Active Exeter, which is focused at um, kind of middle-aged adults who maybe find that activity is, is, is tough to fit into their busy lifestyles. And projects like City Fit Club, uh, Beginner Running, that um, the City Community Trust and other partners are delivering across the city uh, are really starting to show a difference in the activity levels here. For the last three years, we've grown the amount of people that are active by 3% year on year through the Active Live Survey. And I think you'll probably see some of the, the, the impact of that out and about on the streets. I certainly notice when I go to other places that you don't see the number of people out on the roads, running in the evening, cycling and walking to work. And we do actually have one of the highest rates of cycling to walking to work in Exeter, and it's something that we want to improve on. I've talked a little bit about Cranbrook. Sport England were really interested in investing in an area uh, that's <coughs> different, that's growing, that's a new community. It's developer-led. Developer Houses are growing up. Um, houses are being delivered on a really, really rapid basis, and actually moving to a new, a new community where you don't know anyone and you don't know what's on your doorstep and what exists. Actually, physical activity and sport opportunities are probably at the, the back of your mind. So, how can we help change that mindset? And also, the time is right in terms of the growth agenda, uh, in terms of um, the economy, in terms of population growth. The city and Cranbrook are moving in a really, really positive direction, uh, and we want to build on that enthusiasm through business, through communities, to work with a really, really broad range of people to make physical activity um, kind of top of the agenda here in Exeter and Cranbrook. Absolutely, um, we have strong local strategic leadership. We have a really, really strong Greater Exeter Strategic Sports Board, Exeter Health and Wellbeing Board, and a range of organisations, businesses, communities in the voluntary sector are represented on those organisations, making uh, decisions and securing investment into the city for the, the longer term. We have a really great, as I've said, a great track record of delivery with our local physical activity and sport networks. And as we've heard, we have great local research and analytical expertise on our doorstep in terms of measurement um, of physical activity. Sport England um, were really, really impressed uh, when they came to visit uh, in an assessment at the end of 2017, uh, beginning of 2018, on, on the kind of common purpose and vision around the city. And we're starting to see that today through our city brand of X to Live Better and the Move More Cranbrook movement um, just over the road, five miles away. We, um, and I guess linking in terms of some of the science and some of the data, we've worked really, really hard over the last six months in um, targeting those areas of our city that have the highest rates of inactivity. And this map um, is built on a data set that has a range of different metrics around health, around obesity, around deprivation, and other health and social indicators. And we've been able to map those areas that have uh, the highest risk of adults being inactive across the city. And absolutely, that's where we'll, we'll target first in terms of interventions, campaigns, policies, and strategies to help those people be active. Um, and for those of you that, that know Exeter really well, and I'm sure many of you are from Exeter, you'll be able to kind of recognise some of those areas across the city. Um, we uh, kind of, oh, I don't know if that's working, we have the, a kind of what we call a deprivation crescent, which has some of the highest areas of deprivation that are in the top 10% most deprived areas in the country, uh, including Wanford, Whipton, uh, Beacon Heath, and areas of Exwick. Um, We've done a significant amount of work with Public Health Devon around health intelligence um, to point us towards these places where, as I say, the adult, there, there are the highest amount of adults at risk of, of being inactive. And we've obviously also got the large area of Cranbrook to uh, focus on as well. We've worked with our partners at Devon County Council and um, City Science to understand a little bit more about um, travel to work. One of the, I guess, the prices of economic growth uh, and population growth in the city um, is congestion. And I'm sure many of you that drive on a daily basis through Exeter will be living and breathing the issues that we have around congestion in the city. And one of the answers to that is absolutely sustainable travel and helping more people walk and cycle, whether that's to work, whether that's to local shops and utilities, or whether that's the, the school run with your families. And actually this map, uh, once again backed by a, a significant amount of data, um, highlights those journeys in the city where there are the highest amounts of car travel um, for distances less than five kilometres. Um, 
and you'll see that there are um, a number of routes that lead into Southton, a number of routes that lead into Marsh Barton. So those kind of business areas within the city where people are driving to on a regular daily basis. We'd love to work with organisations, with networks and with businesses in those parts of the city um, to look at alternative ways uh, of travel. And there's, there's, there's a huge amount of policy change um, physical environment change and behaviour change support that organisations um, would require to help them on that, that journey and we're absolutely up for working with you around your active travel policies, active travel plans and helping the local infrastructure in terms of walking and cycling. We've got a really, really bold aspiration um, to over the next three years to help 10,000 of our least active residents leave active lifestyles on a daily basis. We've split that into two strands. There's a health strand, so we're re really, really deeply working with local communities with a range of different interventions, projects and programs to help improve population level health. And then the other strand is around walking and cycling, so helping 4,000 people across the city choose active travel on a regular basis. We've designed um, a program over the last six months which takes us to some specific settings, working with families through schools, working with staff and employers through workplaces, through networks such as these, um, and working in our communities through our program Wellbeing Exeter, which is an asset-based de um, community development program um, which supports social prescribing. So those of you that might have heard recently in the press about social prescribing um, and doctors prescribing community activities for mental well-being and health improvement rather than pills and potions, we're um, going to be working with the um, extra primary care program and all the doctors' surgeries in the city to help them prescribe into physical activity opportunities in their local community um, and help people access local green space, a local leisure centre, community opportunities and projects that are delivered by our partners that are already in, in the city. We already have a community connector, somebody having conversations that a doctor can refer to in every single doctor's surgery um, in the city. It's not widely known and we'd really like to communicate that out to a range of different um, organisations so that they're, available, uh, that they're aware that that's, that's available. I'll move briefly on to evaluation, um, which links really, really nicely into um, what Lisa was talking about and also the role of technology in this. Um, w we know that self-reporting is um, not the most robust way of measuring physical activity um, on a local level. Um, and we're really, really keen um, to build in some physical activity, um, real-time measurement to be able to understand the activity levels of people in Exeter and Cranbrook. So I think there was a question uh, in the top corner about how can we um, um, scale, deliver this at scale and understand the impact of physical activity on population level. Um, the investment from Sport England and our evaluation framework will really look to do that at population level. So we want to work with thousands of people across the city to understand their physical activity behaviour. Um, and I don't think I've um, used the right diagram there, uh, Lisa. Um, but absolutely, how do we um, do the self-reporting bit through the questionnaires and active live survey and measure that against real-time real, real -time physical activity through wearable tech, through accelerometry? And I think this will be one fascinating bit out of the program will be the actual difference between the self-reported amount of physical activity and what's actually happening with real people, real lives, on the ground, on a daily basis. And to be able to map some of that really, really intelligent information that Lisa showed us against um, what people are telling us that they do will be really, really interesting. <coughs> Uh, there's a little bit more about some of the organisations across the city. We've just highlighted there um, the, the top 20 in terms of um, number of staff at organisations. We want to work with large organisations, with networks, with small organisations, um, specifically with the um, industrial estates and business communities across the city to work with workplaces to help staff m be more active. We've heard that there's a real issue around sedentary work in lifestyles. How can we help organisations within the city to help their staff be more active? And that's the cultural things um, in terms of organisational policy, um, maybe daily uh, walking meetings, standing desks, um, but also the opportunities in and around our workplaces to have more formal activity. Things like the extra business games, um, 
after work couch to 5k groups, lunchtime badminton, uh, hit classes in, in the morning pre-work and we've got some resource and working with our local partners we'd love to work with organisations that, that want to get involved in that but it's not just the large employers, we're keen to work with business networks such as yourselves as a network to really grow a movement around helping more people uh, be active. And I guess that's um, the final bit for me is the kind of call to action. Hopefully you're re really, really, really keen to get involved uh, with this in Exeter and Cranbrook. You've got my contact details through this presentation. I'm really keen to have a conversation with you. A, if your business, your business network, um, your organisation would like to get involved. Um, but also if you've got any um, solutions, ideas around digital and tech technology solutions to help people be active, we'd be really, really interested. We're connecting into Sport England nationally, who are running a digital platform and a digital accelerator uh, for tech-based companies to help provide solutions nationally. And there's also an open data initiative um, where Sport England are working with a range of different organisations to access data about physical activity. So I think somebody asked a question about um, kind of mobile phone, Fitbit, um, and information that you can get through your mobile devices. That's really, really complicated, but Sport England are having those national conversations about how we can pull all that data to make use of it on a, on a local level. We've got an ambitious aspiration, 10,000 people over the next three years. We know we can't do it on our own. We need the business community um, to support us, to help tell the message, but also help us reach that target by helping your, your staff within your organisations be, be more active. Um, I'm absolutely more than happy to take questions um, for those of you who want to. I'll let you control it, okay? Yeah, okay. So I'll point up to you. Hi, Glen King from Glen King PR. Um, I think this is fantastic, I really do. And one little thing that I always do when I am sedentary in the office I, is when I get a phone call or make one, I stand up, but apparently that doesn't make any difference, <laughs> so um, I'm going to have to walk with my mobile. Um, with regards to Cranbrook, um, I can see why that's been chosen um, for the pilot scheme. How successful was the launch? How much engagement, how much are they behind you on this? And also, how are you going to schedule activities based on age and capabilities? How is that all broken down? Uh, great question. Um, so we've started that engagement process with Cranbrook. Um, it's, a, it's a complex community. It's a new community, uh, developer-led. Um, in terms of the, the housing there, it, it's a challenge around infrastructure. Um, so having conversations about how families in particular in that community can be active whilst there isn't that traditional infrastructure there is, is quite a challenging conversation to have with them at the moment. Where's my leisure centre? Where's my swimming pool? Um, where's, the, where's the gym? We don't have that on our doorstep and that's absolutely fair. Um, having said that, um, for those of you that either live in Cranbrook or have um, been to visit it recently, there's a really kind of growing community um, feel around activity that's not traditional. Um, and actually, I think it was just a fortnight ago, there's a community-led beginner running group that hosted a Couch to 5K. Um, and over 90 people um, met in the centre of Cranbrook to go on a run in the evening, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It's actually 90 people in Cranbrook. It's quite a significant percentage of the local population. Um, it's all being delivered by local volunteers. They're really getting behind it. And actually, it's activities like that that make make it feel really normal in that place at the moment and actually that's um, helping people think about activity and get out for a run before um, maybe some of the bigger infrastructure that will support them around um, leisure centre swimming pool which might be a few years away yet they, there are still those opportunities to be active and actually there's a really great country park in Cranbrook as well um, which has been has had quite a lot of investment in, in recent years so in terms of walking, cycling, uh, buggy walks. Um, there are some great things in that local community already. Um, and in terms of that ongoing engagement piece, it's a balance of how we can infuse people and motivate them um, to be active whilst there aren't those traditional things um, and may not be for, for a few years. Um, in terms of targeting the population, uh, it's very small, so we'd like to think that we could do that across the population in Cranbrook. Um, but there's a range of different um, opportunities throughout the day and in the evening for, for, for all ages. The focus of this program is absolutely about families and we're working with the two schools in Cranbrook, the primary school and the all through education campus about using the school as a setting to, to engage those families. There are some, 
startling statistics um, coming out of the nursery and the primary school in Cranbrook about um, the number of um, young children not meeting age-related rec expectations when they enter nursery and preschool and primary school around toilet training, around speech, around communication, around behaviour, and it's around about twice the national average of not meeting those expectations. So there's also there's, there's already some challenging issues that are emerging in Cranbrook around children and young people, which we absolutely want to support through physical activity. Sorry, that was a very long answer. I like when I get on a roll. I uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I'll pass it. There next. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. Um, interpreting your your presentation, there you've got eight million, ten million pounds to spend. I'm just intrigued as to because a lot of a lot of what you're what you've been talking about has been volunteer based. Yeah. I'd imagine there's some big numbers there that you've got targeted for stuff. I'd be interested as to where that's going to go. Yeah, it's a great, great question. So actually, we had our first uh, board meeting um, on Monday, um, and now we're now going through an investment process um, with Sport England to get the, the first chunk of doing money, if you like. Um, and we're going to be applying for um, up to £5 million to invest in a range of different things uh, ac across the city. Um, I guess in terms of the target that we're seeking to achieve, that will probably be broken down into two areas. So the more community-based uh, grassroots activity opportunities um, in terms of uh, meeting those health outcomes. So we'll be investing in volunteer development, training, utilising the expertise of our, our, our uh, partners like City Community Trust, the leisure facilities, local clubs, local groups to maybe help uh, broaden their offer to those inactive populations. We're, we're, we're really, really successful as a city in the, the, the kind of data tells us that we get active people more active. Um, that's probably been at a price of really, really working with those communities that aren't, and that will require investment. Um, we're also going to look to enhance the Wellbeing Exeter program, so those connectors I talked about in doctor surgeries, prescribing into physical activity. They have a great conversation at the moment, but there's not necessarily that link into those opportunities on the ground, whether it's a walking group, a running group, into the leisure centre, projects and programmes that, um, that we already deliver in the city. City Fit Club's a, a, a great example, um, and I, I don't want to steal these guys' thunder, but it's a, a, a project um, where men who have maybe lapsed out of taking part in football um, in recent years and are maybe experiencing some health um, health issues are coming back to play five-a-side on a regular basis to get back into uh, being active. And it's those sorts of programs that are really targeted at those people who are not taking, uh, who are not active every day at the moment. Those are examples of projects that we'd, we'd like, to, like to work with. Really, really specifically looking at our target populations across the city. The other strand of the investment around active travel um, with, um, say, £5 million, that's not going to build loads and loads of new cycle superhighways across the city, but it will be able to help us invest in small-scale infrastructure projects across the city to help it feel more safe uh, and inclusive to be able to walk and cycle. Um, things um, like planters in, in roads, um, s uh, walkways make them more attractive, um, th there's the opportunity to do things like um, filtered permeability where you, you close some, some roads, which has happened really successfully in other areas. And we've got examples in Europe, um, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, where actually the local infrastructure envir environment enables people to walk and cycle. How can we maybe test and learn some of that in some specific communities um, in Exeter? And work with local businesses. We know that um, a couple of the... The real barriers um, to people walking and cycling to work is the infrastructure at work. So in terms of cycle parking, in terms of showers, in terms of safe places to put, uh, to put your bike, in terms of access, how can we do some of those small infrastructure things in some of these places to help people um, walk and cycle to work more? Um, that initial investment, five million pounds to support some, some of those things. Um, we've not got all the answers. Love to hear solutions from, from community and businesses themselves. Uh, thank you. Um, Richard Warner from the Dome County Agricultural Association and, and West Point over the road there. Um, I was horrified by that stat of, uh, I think, 25% of people or folk per week do less than, you know, 30, 30 minutes of, of active exercise. Yeah. I'm just wondering, w w what's the definition of active? 
Yeah. Because the stepping stone from being sofa to the 5K might just put people off. Yeah, you know, what's the definition of making a start? And we saw those pictures of people stretching there before a meeting. Um, you know, wh what is that? You know, what are the steps? Or wh when does active become, or non-active become <laughs> more active, if you know what I mean? Um, great, great question. Uh, the chief medical officer's guidelines are around 150 minutes of moderate to vis vigorous physical activity per week. Um, and the definition around that, um, uh, without getting too medical, is you know, you know, raising the heart rate, sweaty palms, slightly red in the face, you know, making that real for people. 150 minutes is a, is, a, is a long time to be active if you're not doing anything at the moment. So I guess what we want to do through encouraging people is that kind of nudge behavior to do the first 10 minutes. So if you're doing less than 30 minutes and you're not doing it at a moderate to vigorous level, actually a couch to 5K, running 5K, ab absolutely that's probably quite far away from wha what you're thinking of doing. Um, but actually walking the stairs, walking to the shops, some of those um, exercises that you can do on your own in the home might be your first step towards that. And that through, through the kind of couch to 5K digital app um, and other online solutions, that, that might be the next step before you have the confidence then to m maybe join a local community group or one of those kind of more formal opportunities. But um, yeah, thir 30 minutes is um, less than 30 minutes inactive, 30 to 150 minutes, it's called fairly active, and then 150 minutes beyond, you're, you're an active um, member of the population. But that's two and a half hours of, of moderate physical activity per week, which is, which is a lot for somebody that's doing nothing at the moment. Hi there. Dave from WPA Healthcare. Um, I think it's a question maybe to you and Lisa, or unless I haven't been listening, but one thing that really seems to unify you both is smartphones. And I think Lisa said that the accelerometers are, are pretty awesome wherever they're situated. <laughs> you know, whether they're in a, a, a two pound Fitbit or an uh, awesome kit at the uni. Yeah. And it seems to me that there's uh, somewhere here that you could collect data and get people to compete. So, for example, I'm about to compete in the CrossFit community. There's going to be over a quarter of a million of us all competing over five weeks against each other. It's incredibly simple. Um, I know the kids have done it at school with this mile thing, and yeah. they register it on their Fitbits, yeah. and they absolutely love it. I'm not saying a 60-year-old will do the same, but if you're about to be given them five million quid, I'm just wondering whether you could talk to each other and yeah. get the whole city humming, because yeah. everybody loves a bit of gadge, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I think there's, there's absolutely right. This, and I'm glad that the enthusiasm and the excitement for it, which is which is great. I think there's two sides of it. There's how we, how we use that kind of real time. Uh, assessment and accelerometry to evaluate the program to show that we're making a difference, but also how we can use the power of digital technology to create this kind of citywide buzz and challenge. And you could see how you could have um, either within community, street by street, community by community, taking part in challenges. And there are loads of examples across the country of those sorts of challenges where um, points, rewards, incentives for taking part in physical activity. Um, and actually, wouldn't it be great if we could do that business to business, community to community, school to school in a really coordinated way? What we do find with some of these challenge type initiatives and interventions is that they, they come and go and the sustainability is not really there. So that's one thing that we'll always have to think about is how through building this movement and the digital solutions, how do we make sure that that embeds the behavior rather than it just be the kind of latest fad and I'm not saying your CrossFit challenge is the latest fad I'm just uh, that you know we just really need to make sure that the the kind of volunteers the community base and the behavior change is really happening alongside those those things Um, <coughs> so, yeah, one of the most uh, successful public health interventions to get people more active was done in Australia, and it was all about um, creating, uh, helping people do 10,000 steps, which is probably a message that we've all heard. Um, but one of their things was also having sort of company competitions, um, competitions with your friends, and at that time it wasn't on smartphones, but it's a really useful piece of technology for us to use to try and embed those sort of competitions. Yeah. But obviously... Yeah, you have to make sure it, it's not a fad and that we do get those behaviour mm -hmm. change um, uh, being consistent across time. But that was a really successful, it might be looking at sort of how they rolled that out yeah. um, and we could probably learn a bit from that. 
two fantastic apps through Public Health England, Couch to 5K, uh, which is sh showing huge impact and, and success. A uh, 12 week program on your phone uh, provides you with um, motivation throughout that period and what you need to do every week to progress from doing nothing to your first 5K. And the other one is an Active 10 walking app, um, which is really, really interesting. It calculates the bouts of um, 10 minutes worth of brisk walking that you do. Uh, and I've tracked that myself. And um, the, the days when I walk to work or drive to work, are really stark and noticeable on that app and actually just seeing some of that information played back to you helps you think about how active you are on a, on a day basis. Hi, uh, just one quick question. If we've got this money, why don't we just develop the Healthy City app ourselves and then sell it to all the other local authorities, sell it to the other 10 who are part of the 11, make a little yep. bit of cash on the side and use all that data? Those sorts of ideas are absolutely welcome. I think we've we've got a really strong digital tech and analytical kind of um, community here here in Exeter, and I've no doubt that those ideas, concepts are, are building up as we speak. And yeah, you're absolutely right. If if one thing that we can share across the country is an innovative solution around a digital app, um, which Exeter and Cranbrook are behind, then that could be one thing that we can scale in. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yep. So we'd be keen to talk to local entrepreneurs, digital data uh, companies around what their ideas might be for that. Hi, uh, John Wesley from Thompson General. I live and work in Exeter. Uh, can you tell us anything about the swimming pool situation? Because that does seem to be uh, a real barrier to activity at the moment. Yeah, that's... Um, Obviously, there's a whole long conversation here, um, and I, I don't really want to get into the conversation around the um, the leisure facilities here, here here in the city at the moment. But I will answer your question because swimming is absolutely crucial. It's a life skill. Um, it's really imp really really important that every young person in the city um, is able to swim, and and at the moment. Um, the quality of provision that we have here is is not up to scratch uh, and we're going to be working really really hard to make sure that that's improved in the future um, we've obviously just broken ground on the um, on the bus station site for uh, a, a new flagship swimming pool that's going to be um, here um, towards the end of 2020 um, and we've also got plans to um, get Riverside back up and running um, you're absolutely right. The quality of the offer around swimming at the moment needs to be improved, and we're going to work hard to do that. And whilst we're telling a, this message and we have this investment around getting people active, actually the staple things, the life skills, the swimming, the cycling, the walking, are the most crucial foundations for our young people and our families to be active. So it's something that I'm personally going to be working quite, quite hard to, to improve. Uh, Maureen Cable from um, Helpline Telecare Solutions for the uh, for the elderly. Um, I think this is a really exciting initiative, and I'm really really pleased to to hear about Exeter doing all these wonderful things. But I also feel that it's important that we don't apply the brakes, as in the um, lack of swimming provision, but also um, an, an observation um, that in the centre of Exeter, you know, we've. Um, we've let go a healthy juice bar in the Guildhall Centre and replaced it with, um, with Krispy Kreme. Um, and if we're looking at uh, reducing obesity, it seems yeah. that that's not quite the message, perhaps, that, that, that this project is, uh, is giving. That's a, it, it, it's a great point, um, and there's some work that we have to do at kind of planning policy level as well to ensure that the message we're telling around our active and healthy lifestyles is lived and breathed through that as well. Obviously, um, we don't have control of, of all of that at the moment, but this program is an opportunity to help us influence policy. This is not just, just about individuals and projects on the ground. It's about making those really, really tough planning and policy level uh, changes as well, because without that, um, those healthy food outlets will keep um, popping up in areas of high football and in terms of behaviour change it's exactly the opposite of what we want to try and achieve in terms of healthy active people so I agree with you Public Health Devon have got their Sugar Smart campaign um, and, and we need to work closer with them to ensure um, that, we, um, that we don't see too many things that are going to bang up against our mission to get people healthy and, and active thanks for the question
Hi, James. One thing you haven't spoken very much about, which might be useful to emphasize, if, uh, assuming you know all the answers, is that <laughs> one of the things is, uh, in terms of education, that it's about sometimes the, the, the uh, behavior of the children's reflective of that of the parents. And the work you're doing is working at a younger age group that you have before um, in, a, in a different way yeah. to work with the... F when, when you talk about family, what you're also talking about, I'm assuming, is that you're talking about getting the, the children to influence the parents yeah. and vice versa yeah. to actually change it at the very beginning because yeah. it, it'll be a lifestyle for the rest of the... for a longer period of time. Of course, there's all the short-term fixes that we're all working so hard to try and fix now, but also the long-term element that lies underneath this is the the difference between you know going to the doctor as you say yeah. and seeking a medical solution for what's really a social problem mm -hmm. so how that's going to be achieved I'm, I'm i'm very interested in in in, in finding out so and, and i know that there is some work towards that and i know it's one of the focuses but i'm not quite sure how it's going to be you may not be either because i know this is yeah. this is a pilot and that's yeah. the whole point of it yeah. but that's one of the other factors here that i think over the longer term is going to be hugely significant um, so I, th I think there's a couple of things there, and what we have done already is set up a, a kind of a design group with local head teachers um, across the city to um, to work towards how we encourage families to be more active through school settings. Um, a, a large percentage of families um, have their first kind of education awareness around how to be active through either nursery, preschool, or um, or primary school because they they. They, they don't necessarily have those skills around informal play or awareness and that for me is absolutely crucial because that's when it starts when our youngsters are one 80 months two years three years the amount that they play and we know that kind of technology is having a real impact on how active our youngest children are already um, and around about the age of six or seven if those behaviors are not built in we're seeing stark drops in activity levels Young people start off by being active, tearing around, running around, having fun, and at some point that gets knocked out of them. And the family unit is absolutely critical to make sure that families are active together and having those enjoyable experiences when they're younger, which then carries on in the future. We've got great local parks. We've got the key. Um, on our doorstep, we've got great countryside. We've got Holden Forest. We've got beaches down the road. There are great opportunities for people to be active, but it's just not on their radar at the moment. So actually working through children's centres and settings where families come together from the earliest of ages to help encourage families play and be active together is a really, really important part of this programme. We don't have all the answers to it yet, Julian, um, but I think bringing together preschool, children's centre, schools, healthcare, community and voluntary opportunities um, is an important part to play for, for families. Well, what fascinating talks. Um, I just want to do a straw poll then. So we have a pile of bacon rolls over there. So the next quarterly event, do you want fruit or do you want bacon rolls? So bacon rolls. Fruit. Okay. 30-30. There was no, there's, there's some people didn't vote. Okay, whatever. Right. Just uh, before we start networking then and have another coffee, etc., I'd just like to give a notification of a few more events that are coming up. So, extra chamber notices are, there's a business breakfast briefing with Karim Hassan. That's on the 7th of February, 8.30 to 10. That's extra library. Speakers Karim Hassan. There's a CIM marketing clinic, uh, how to measure marketing effectiveness. That's the 21st of February. That's at Sandy Park. And the speakers are Samir Rahan, who's the chair of the Wales Regional Board of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. Um, and then there's the Meet the Neighbour with uh, ne sorry, Meet the Neighbour Networking Lunch with Somerset and Devon Chambers, and that's on the 27th of February, and that's at Deer Park Country House. And that note, I'd like to I think to bring it to a close and just start the networking. Thank you very much. <laughs>